follow this YouTube channel right now. All of my friends, all of my subscribers, if you want to stay tuned to what's happening on the continent and right here in the heartbeat of Africa, which is Ghana, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you very much for checking us out. I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Come follow me to a secret place where only the moon. It is Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere who in one of his many enlightened moments said, when I hear the Europeans saying that we should open our markets in the name of globalization and they say that the rules are the same, I laugh, Mwalimu said. And he said, it is like a boxing match. The rules are the same. But you don't put a heavyweight boxer and a lightweight boxer and say the rules are the same. <laughs> it is murder. <laughs> Allow me to be melodramatic. You imagine the United States of America with a GDP of anything between 14 trillion and 15 trillion is now entering into a bilateral arrangement with Lesotho, <laughs> whose GDP is two, two billion. And you say, the rules are the same. <laughs> it is a joke. It is murder. Because the revenue that is generated by the city of Los Angeles alone in one day is more than the GDP of Lesotho. So we are being told to open our markets, and when we opened our markets, you saw what happened? Our textile industries died. The large textile industry that we knew about in Kaduna, in Nigeria, died. Our cotton industries died. Our sugarcane industries died. Our waters, even water nowadays, water, 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 water. Dasani, Coca-Cola gives us water, water. You go to hotels in African countries, the water that we drink has the standardization, not this one, this is from UCC. <laughs> but this is the exception rather than the rule, this is the exception. The rule is water, Dasani sitting in Atlanta, Georgia, determining what water we take, we of the middle class. <laughs> Making Africa work is my subject. <laughs> what, will we, what will it take? It will take our combined effort. But there must be an enlightenment of a totally different character. You know, when I think about Africa, and I think about her often, and I ask myself, Mother Africa, how will you be a hundred years from today? And I remember the great Sudanese poet, Al-Faituri, writing about Africa. He says, oh, Mother Africa, how are you? <laughs> Will you be great? You, Mother Africa, where you are rebels, have gained power and rebuilt and they have destroyed what they rebuilt. Mother Africa, will you be great? You, Mother Africa, Faituri asks, you the home of great rivers, will your sons ever fish in your rivers? Faituri asks, you, Mother Africa, whose belly is laden with all things known as natural resources, Will you ever give meaning to them, Faituri asks. Oh, Mother Africa, are you waiting for God or Mother Africa? I believe that Africa can be made great again. But remember I said, 
that Africa took the view that she could grow regionally. That is where I went on a tangent. Now I come back. So the East African community was there. South African development community was there. We had Comesa, we had EGAD, we, had, we have ECOWAS, we had Central African Organization, we had the Maghreb, we had the Sahelians. All these attempts have been made and somehow Africa is still punching below her weight. Let us look at the different sectors so that we are better able to appreciate what Africa can be. And I believe that Africa can be great. I believe that Africa is capable of looking at our agriculture because if a people cannot feed themselves, they cannot be at the dinner table of civilization. Today, Africa cannot feed herself. Here in Ghana, they love rice. They produce a little and import most. <laughs> Here in Ghana, they love ketchup but I suspect they import some. Here in Ghana, they love chicken. They produce some, but I suspect they import some. In Nigeria, I suspect they love meat, and I suspect they import some. They love rice. Here in Ghana, I know they produce cocoa, and they love chocolate, but the chocolate they make, they don't like very much. They import chocolate from, from, from Switzerland. <laughs> so until the day that we begin to like what we produce, so that we add value, I look forward to the day when the greatest chocolate making factories will be here in Ghana, and the next will be in Togo, and the next in Cote d'Ivoire. It can be done which calls into question what are our universities of agriculture doing? Are they involved? Are they included in the agenda of making Africa gain? And I'm saying that history has demonstrated that when people decide to work in agriculture, they can actually do something about it. I remember so very vividly in your own Malawi, when President Mbingu Wamutarika took power, he took the view that he could improve agriculture in Malawi. He took the view that he could produce enough maize. He took the view that Malawians could do it. And you will agree with me, they did it. It was done in Malawi. Why can it not be done now? I remember so very vividly, those of you who are from Burkina Faso, in 1983 when Thomas Sankara took power, he took the view that the Burkina Bay could feed themselves, and within five years, Burkina Faso could feed herself. It can be done. I know that right now I remember so very vividly in Zimbabwe when President Mugabe took power and even before then during the first five years Mugabe's government was capable of producing enough maize to be consumed in Zimbabwe and enough cotton to make clothes. Today as I speak to you now the Zimbabweans are under threat of starvation. What happened? It can't be done in Zimbabwe and I believe that it must be done if Africa is to work. Africa can work in agriculture. Africa can work in innovation. I'm very glad that in the last one year in Makerere, Uganda, they have come up with a solar-powered bus. Ugandans can do it. I'm very glad that in Nigeria, only last week they unveiled a car that is made out of hydrocarbons. Nigerians can do it. I'm glad that in Morocco now they have the largest uh, solar plant in the world. It can be done. I'm glad that in my own Kenya they now have one of the largest wind farms which generates power. It can be done. I'm glad that during the president of Akufuado, Ghanaians have now abandoned one of the words they used to have in their vocabulary called doom so. I'm glad. <laughs> In other words, if you look very keenly, there are things that can be done. And I'm suggesting to us that in order to do these things, we must ask ourselves how it can be achieved. 
As I draw to the conclusion of my intervention, I now want to talk of the new threats. How can we make a lot of writing has been done in the recent past about Africa. There are things, there are certain things that Africa must do and there are certain things that Africa must not do. The belief that we can borrow money from multilateral institutions and become rich is misguided. Zambia's Dambi Samoy in a book Dead Aid tells us it cannot be done. That is the route not to take. The belief that we will follow a model that is conceived on our behalf by European universities is misguided. I want you to read the book written by a Korean called Ha Jun Chang, The Bad Samaritans, in which he argues that each country must find a model that suits our own circumstances. It can be done. I want also to remember a book which all of you must have read, written by my own Kenyan friend, Dr. Kalestas Juma, The New Harvest, in which he says that Africans must invent and innovate. I want you to read a book written by Olusha Gunobasanjo and Greg Mills, among others, making Africa work. Africa can be made to work. But Africa will only be made to work when she is conscious of her current position. Which brings me to a question that we must now pose. What is the danger of other powers operating in Africa? Do they threaten our being? And I'm now talking about China. China is a very interesting country from which there is a lot of things to learn. But she is also a danger to the continent, if we are not careful. What is there to learn from China? The thing to learn from China is that during our lifetime, the Chinese, through their ingenuity, have succeeded in lifting nearly 800 million people out of poverty. What did the Chinese do? Is there something that we can learn from them? I think there is. Those of you who have the advantage and the privilege of serving in government, ask yourself, what did the Chinese do that within our own lifetime they succeeded in doing that? And they are everywhere, the Chinese. They know what they want. I think the first thing that you must do, you must know what you want. You know, last year I was sitting and watching a Chinese uh, news uh, channel and if you want to understand what others who are potentially your friends and enemies are doing, you must listen to their news. <laughs> I was watching the CGTN and I was listening to the 6,000 delegates in China sitting and thinking about China how China will deal with Africa and the world a hundred years from thence. The people who are there will not be alive. In many African countries, if you tell them to think about what will happen tomorrow, they say, only God knows. No. <laughs> I hold the view that when you are planning, you plan as if you will never die. And if you are prayerful, you pray as if you'll die the next minute. <laughs> I'm suggesting that the Chinese have given us away. Today, the Chinese, and see how the Chinese are working with us. Which university in Africa, worth its name, does not have a Confucius center? I do not know whether you have one here at UCC. <laughs> Why do the Chinese have a Confucius center? Because the mind is the standard of the man. Once you influence the mind, you can sit pretty because you can predict what the mind will do. How many of you who are the middle class today, in addition to asking your children to read French and Germany, are now asking and encouraging their children, go ye and learn Mandarin. How many of you? Confucius Center to work on your mind. On our mind. And then, 
How many countries in Africa don't you find a stadium built by Chinese? And if it is not a stadium, it is your state house. <laughs> and if it is not the state house, it is the African headquarters. And if it is not the African headquarters, is infrastructure, is the road or the railway. And if it is not the railway, it is the four lorries. And if it is not those, in the next ten years, out of every ten phones used by you will be Chinese. If it is not techno, it is Infinix. If it is not Infinix, it is Huawei. No African country produces a phone. None. It's only Rwanda that is beginning to assemble some. There is something to admire about the Chinese. But if we want to benefit the, from the Chinese, we must be strong. We must be weak. We must not be weak. We must negotiate continentally. The Koreans are also small but strong. But if we are not careful, and I'm saying this, if we are not careful, in the next 25 years, all of us will be speaking Mandarin. If we are not careful, if we are not careful, because the Chinese here are not here for charity, the Chinese are here to do business. And in the world of business, it is a cruel world where throats are literally cut. I'm reading a small book written by a young Chinese girl called Arin Yuan Sun, the next factory of the world. And the young Chinese girl is saying exactly what I'm saying. He says that Africa can benefit from China. Africa can be the next factory of the world. But it's not just going to happen. Something must be done about it. Which is what brings me to the last segment of my conversation, Africa Agenda 2063. I remember on that day, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Nko Sazana and Lamini Zuma, the then chairman of the organization of, African, of the African Union, writing and reading an imaginary letter to Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma. I will not remember the words exactly, but I'll remember it in substance. And in substance, he will say, by the year 2063, we Africans having recognized that we may have lost the last 50 years of our independence, will not lose the next 50 years of our independence. I'm adding a few things in order to make it relevant. But she was saying, in effect, the Osagie for in the year 2063, Africa will be different. There'll be an electric rail running from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to Dhaka in Senegal. In the year 2063, Africa will be feeding herself, and the breadbasket of Africa will be Zimbabwe in Southern Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Africa will be making her own furniture and we will do so in a sustainable manner with the equatorial forests of Congo being the source of our products. I will remember in those, in those years to come, what you now see as the Sahara Desert will have been greened. Africa will be covered in forests. The Democratic Republic of Congo will become the equivalent of the Silicon Valley. There will be rare earth. Africa will use funds made by African Africa will refine their own oil. Africa will use our own copper. Africa will have excess electricity. Africa will have the Inga Dam in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Africa will have built the Grand Renaissance Dam. And indeed, at that time, Sudan will not quarrel with Ethiopia, and Egypt will not quarrel with Ethiopia. They will be using these resources well. Africa will not be importing fish, tilapia from China. 
the fish will be produced in Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Tana, and all these other places. That was the reason of Africa Agenda 2063. It was a dream. But is it not true that we must all dream? We must dream. The only thing that we must do once we have dreamt, we must wake up. The problem is sometimes we dream and we don't wake up. We must wake up and now begin to implement. 